today in our following of uh, Mark's depiction of the events that led up to Jesus', Jesus crucifixion, our uh, passage homes in on two characters, Jesus and Peter. It may not be immediately apparent, but there's good news to be found in both of these. It's my task today to help you see it. Please turn to page 986, the Church Bibles, Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 53. Jesus is brought before an impressive lineup. The high priest and all the chief priests and teachers of the law. It's remarkable uh, that in an age of so many uh, wandering preachers and teachers, Jesus should command such attention. Clearly, he'd made an impact for all of Israel's brightest and best to come to band together to see what could be done. What sort of trial was this? Even by the standards of the time, it was uh, unusual, if not to say illegal. Consider the hour. We know it was late from the fact that while Jesus' disciples had been praying, or oh, sorry, when, while Jesus had been praying, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the disciples had been falling asleep. What sort of court meets in the middle of the night? What about its location? No doubt the high priest, Caiaphas, lived amidst suitably plush surroundings, even impressive in their way. But what sort of court meets in a person's home rather than a courthouse? And what of the court's purpose? We might presume that a court is there to determine guilt or innocence. But we're told in verse 55 that the judge and jury the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. It comes as uh, no surprise that this was their sole interest. Back in chapter 11, verse 18, we were told that the chief priests and teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill Jesus, for they feared him. And in the first verse of chapter 14, we uh, read that the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. This was a kangaroo court constituted with one intent, to deliver to those who composed it what they wanted. Jesus' death, come what may. Even so, they struggled. Many testified against him, verse 56, but apparently they hadn't got together to coordinate their lies sufficiently, so their statements did not agree. Some said, verse 57, we heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple, which wasn't an accurate report of what Jesus had said. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days, John 2.19. And so, we're told again, their testimony did not agree. Verse 15, 
said, the high priest intervenes. Things weren't going well as far as he was concerned. He asked the question, verse 60, what is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? What indeed? We could answer that, as he should have been able to do. To do. It was false and contradictory testimony. But then a direct question. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed God? The high priest is asking Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been waiting for? Are you the Son of God? Jesus' response is equally direct. Verse 62. I am. His uttering of those two words together had significance in themselves. Echoing Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Jesus fleshes out his answer by quoting from the Old Testament book of Daniel. There was no doubt about what he was saying. What you have asked about me is the case. It is true. This really was the crux of the matter. If the court had any real purpose, it was to determine whether what Jesus was saying about himself was the case or not. If it wasn't, then yes, he deserved to die, for it was blessed. But what if it was true? The irony was that the entire Jewish religious system was focused on waiting expectantly for the long-promised Messiah. But the Jewish leaders duly assembled couldn't bring themselves countenance that Jesus might be him. Perhaps Jesus offended their sensibilities. A carpenter from Nazareth, the Messiah. But perhaps any Messiah would have in fact received a less than warm welcome from them, despite what in theory was the case. For he would turn their world upside down. They had vested interests in keeping things as they were. Thank you very much. No, they weren't interested. They weren't interested in investigating the truth of Jesus' claim about himself. Instead, we see them in their true colors. The high and mighty, duly assembled, the great and the good of Israel, more like a band of thugs. Verse 65. Some began to spit at him, they blindfolded him, and struck him with their fists. Let's turn our attention to Peter. Where was he while all this was going on? What was he doing? Back in verse 54, we were told that Peter followed Jesus at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. 
There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. That detail is repeated at verse 67. Peter was warming himself. We're not told, uh, but I've no reason to think, that Jesus was seated whilst being interrogated and then assaulted. But Peter, well, he was seated and he was warming himself. Peter starts off following Jesus at a distance. This takes him as far as the courtyard, uh, but things start getting too hot, so to speak, when one of the servant girls starts challenging him. Then, verse 68, he retreats further out into the entryway. Peter's observable concerns are his own comfort and his safety. He wants to fit in, to not be noticed. Unfortunately, his accent gives him away. Verse 70. Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. Perhaps at this, Peter goes into panic mode. What he then utters is his lowest point ever. We read at verse 71. He began to call down curses on himself. The word himself isn't in the original Greek. It just says, he began to curse. I can't think of why Peter would curse himself. I'm afraid that I find it more likely that he cursed Jesus. I don't know this man you're talking about. Luke's telling of the parable of a good Samaritan ends with Jesus asking, which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law can't bring himself to articulate the obvious answer, the Samaritan. Instead, he refers obliquely to the one who had mercy on him. I can't. This Peter can't even bring himself to say Jesus' name. I don't know this man you're talking about. I said at the start, uh, but I'd endeavor to bring you good news from today's passage. Uh, I'll admit that what I've presented so far doesn't appear that way. Seen individually, both Jesus and Peter's are sorry tales. But I believe that Mark presents them side by side for a purpose. How do we know what occurred? It's highly likely that Mark got his account firsthand from Peter. I can imagine. Peter saying to Mark, tell it how it was. Warts and all. People need to know this. People need to know this about me. Why so? When you hear an account, where do you imagine yourself in the story? Peter intends us to see ourselves in his place. He's imagining Christians who follow Jesus, but only at a distance. He's thinking of those he knows 
whose first concern is their own comfort, rather than Jesus, sitting, warming themselves by the fire. He knows our tendency to want to fit in with those who surround us. Not to stand out for Jesus, preferring to retreat out into the entryway. Peter, Peter says to you and me, such was I, but I changed, and you can We're also in the same position that the high priest was when he heard Jesus make his claim uh, about himself. I am. I am the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. I am God. Is this a claim that you're willing to take seriously enough to investigate it? Is it true? Or are you like so many who've already made their mind up about Jesus, either without looking at the evidence for his claims, or else in spite of the evidence? I can see why people do this. For if it is true, it's life changing. It will turn your life upside down. That's what following Jesus closely does to you. You'll stand out. You have to put Jesus first rather than thinking of your own security and comfort. Are you prepared to do so? Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. The temple to which he was referring was his own body. It was destroyed by those who sat in judgment over him when they nailed him to the cross the next day. But three days later, he rose again on that first Easter day. The Sanhedrin sat in judgment over Jesus. But when he quoted from the book of Daniel, Jesus spoke of a time when he will return as judge of all. When Peter broke down and wept at the end of our passage, that was the start of his path to redemption. They were tears of repentance for what he had said, for what he had done. We need to come to that when we acknowledge our need of Jesus for who he is, for what he has done for us, for his willingness to suffer and die on our behalf, in our place. That is the good news that Jesus was willing to go through with what he did for people just like Peter, people like me and you.